He's one of the most articulate thoughts of cutting edge insights into world politics and economics. Ian Bremer, it's great to have you on NDTV. Let me begin with what you make of what is known as a new era, the rise of Trumpism and the demis of globalization. Is that something that we are saying? Are both of them challenging notions that we were previously clinging to? Absolutely. I mean, this is the year of geopolitical recession. Uh, you remember 2008 at uh, Davos uh, when everyone was concerned that the world economy was falling apart. This is the year where the world's geopolitics are falling apart. The United States with the election of Donald Trump has decisively repudiated the idea of American exceptionalism on values, American global leadership on military and security, and American architecture on global trade. We look around the world, there's no one else prepared to actually play that role. I mean, Xi Jinping is going to be here, but the largest ever Chinese delegation uh, to Davos, that's great. But that's not replacing the United States, right? It is a, a globalization alternative that's going to take a long time to actually develop. So what we see this year is a lot of volatility, a lot of uncertainty, and a geopolitical vacuum. But do you feel that we can conclusively say goodbye to globalization? And in many ways, uh, you know, the fact that uh, you mentioned Xi Jinping uh, coming here and addressing what many believe is a defense of globalization is ironic as well, because this is not a country uh, which is pro-capitalist, uh, but yet is coming to this gathering, or many believe, uh, the elites of the capitalist world? Well, look, I mean, they're very pro-consumption, so it's globalization for consumers as opposed to globalization for citizenship. So you're losing those values. I mean, the World Economic Forum was set up as both a business organization, but also in terms of sustainability, public-private partnerships, thinking about long-term how to make globalization work for everybody. Well, that latter piece is not the one the Chinese are particularly interested in, right? They're looking at what can we do to make to get win-wins bilaterally for the Chinese around the world. Globalization is not dead, but for the last several generations, globalization and Americanization were the same thing. Americanization is dead, and there's no other country that's going to fill that role. Uh, Xi Jinping only expresses power economically on a global stage, not in terms of the military, certainly not in terms of diplomatic might or power, not from a technology perspective, not from an energy perspective, and, and they're still new at this. So, I mean, it's great that the Chinese are going to play more of a role in peacekeeping. It's great that they're putting money into global infrastructure, but anyone that thinks that that remotely compares to what the United States did after World War II with the Marshall Plan, with Bretton Woods, with the World Trade Organization, is smoking something, right? I mean, it's not remotely comparable. How does India fit in this new puzzle of the Trump era, but at the same time, it's uh, big domestic moves, our move to demonetization, which was a big, uh, bold call, many believe. It's been equally criticized and lauded uh, for the Indian economy. How does India fit in? Well, India fits in well. I mean, first of all, because India is not really a geopolitical player, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you don't have the diplomatic staff, you don't have a massive military force. That's a useful thing. But what India has is a strong leader. What India has is the ability to actually develop longer-term economic planning. You saw the goods and service tax, which is now being actually executed across the country. That's a really big deal. Now you're going to see big infrastructure spend, which India is way behind China on, but it's great that they're actually doing it. So, it, of course, you're going to feel good about India in that context. Still, you know, when I look forward to 2019, I still don't see Modi with control of the upper house, and so that means that reforms are going to be halting at some level. In the United States, you just elected Trump. You've got Republicans in the House and Senate. The U.S. is in a position that they can actually do more in terms of legislative movement over the next couple of years than India can. That's interesting. And at a time when the IMF has actually pegged us down one notch uh, below China, so we've lost the mantle of being the world's fastest growing economy, at least for this year. We take it back next year. Is that putting at a headline risk as well on the Indian growth story? Because, you know, over the last year or so, we've heard that India is the only eye standing in the bricks, the shining spot, uh, the big emerging market or the large emerging market that everyone's looking out for. Well, I mean, China has been the story for 35 years. It's so much bigger than India is in terms of the size of its economy and has so much more influence globally as a consequence of that. But India is a great story. It's, it's slow moving from a lower start, sure. It's deeply decentralized, but it's also very resilient. 
Uh, the Chinese have to actually deal with the transformation economically with a one-party political system that might not work in a consumer-driven economy, where India's political system, to the extent that it's broken, we've known it's been broken for a very long time. It has nowhere to go but up, right? And so, and I do think that the fact that Modi is building India with leaders from the BJP, state by state, province by province, that's a much more sustainable way to grow an economy, even if it takes a lot longer. Okay, one final question. I know you've written a great article in The Time right now, uh, which is a leading piece of thought uh, provocation. But uh, a key headline that you would intend to take away from Davos, the biggest theme that you feel will be reflective at the end of these three days. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's the establishment is still not panicking. Uh, that the 1% and the 0.1% has never done better in the history of the planet than they're doing right now. And for all of the populist concerns in Europe, in the United States, and more broadly, um, it isn't actually changing the fact that the world's powerful and rich are able to collect here and continue to advance their agenda. Uh, it's still the case in 2017. Okay, will the 1% delete stop controlling the world is a conversation we'll have for another time. But Ian Bremer, many thanks indeed for speaking with us.